Well, I'm so delighted to be invited to be here. I'm going to talk today about best practices in lesbian and bisexual women's health. And I'm going to uh, first just say I have no disclosures. And finally, after 40 years of being a medical student resident, fellow, and faculty member, lesbians and bisexual women have been declared an official underserved medical population. We've known that, but it's not been documented. There's very little research in lesbian health. Um, I'm a member of Women in Medicine Conference, which is a annual scientific meeting for lesbian physicians, their partners, and their families. And about 25 years ago, we started the Lesbian Health Fund, where we fund research in lesbian health as pilot projects. Some of our researchers have gone on to NIH and have become researchers in sexual minority issues, and we're very proud of them. But again, there's very little evidence that I'm usually, being from UCSF, full of in terms of my lectures. And the other issue that we have here is, what is a lesbian, and how do you decide who a lesbian is to, to include them in your study? So some of this is mixed. We now know that actually bisexual women are the largest uh, population in female sexual minority identified people, and they've been very neglected. And as we do the research, we're finding out that bisexual women's health is actually poorer than lesbian health, which is poorer than heterosexual health. So I'm just going to kind of start with that basis, and so that you understand this is um, an emerging field. You can contribute to it greatly, and you can contribute to your patient's health tremendously by just listening to their stories and helping them as a healer. So the Institute of Medicine in 2011 had a white paper which um, it was declared that sexual minorities were underserved, under-researched, et cetera. The NIH just defined um, sexual minority patients uh, as needing more research, as underserved, and many professional organizations, including WHO, have come out and really talked about the barriers to health and the poor health outcomes of this group. What are barriers? Well, when I was a resident, I had an argument with the surgery resident in the ER of San Francisco General about a lesbian with pelvic pain and whether lesbians could have pelvic inflammatory disease or not, or was it an ovarian cyst that ruptured? So we put her in the hospital, and believe it or not, in those days, we didn't have computers. We had these big books called Index Medica, so I went and looked up lesbian, and there were three articles. One, anyway, they weren't related to PID. She went home the next day. She obviously ruptured her ovarian cyst, and I decided to study this issue, so I begged, borrowed didn't quite steal, but supplies to open up a clinic to study STDs and lesbians. And we actually studied 176 sexually active lesbians and found that they had more abnormal pap smears, that they often did have a history of STDs, but they had a tremendous history of discrimination by healthcare providers, including a story of a young woman who had shared with her family doctor that she had a female sexual partner at the age of 16. By the time she got home, the family doctor called her mother to tell her, because he was also her mother's physician, that her daughter was a lesbian, and then she was kicked out of her home and was homeless. So it's really important to ensure confidentiality if a patient shares with you their sexual orientation. And that includes also putting it in the medical chart, because many states there's no job protection for lesbians and some businesses are self-insured. So if someone has an operation and the company gets the bill and they find out someone's put down she has a female partner, she could lose her job. So you have to be careful. And so I always ask my patients, are you okay with my putting it in the chart? Now our electronic medical record, which is EPIC at UCSF, we have all kinds of questions including sexual orientation, what pronoun do you want us to use, gender identity, but again, you need to kind of respect people's personal barriers. There's also structural barriers to medical care besides just a previous bad experience in someone's office. Um, in terms of financial challenges, we know the LGBT community is um, often discriminated against, especially the trans community, and they often don't have medical insurance. Thank goodness. This is my personal point of view. The ACA survived because it's really improved the health of the LGBT community. And right now, Trump has taken off a questionnaire on aging LGBT identification. I mean, we're in an administration that we're going to lose some of the gains for access to health care that we've had previously. 
So some of the data actually goes all over the world. Now there's starting to be interest uh, worldwide in outcomes of health in this minority, including the U.S. found that um, most lesbians and bisexual women didn't think the doctor spent enough time with them. Women in Israel in particular got less care. And WHO, you can see that quote, LGBT people often experience poor health outcomes in the general population that profoundly affect them. So I'm going to take a little survey of your knowledge of lesbian health. Um, who thinks that lesbian and bisexual women smoke at a higher prevalence than heterosexual women? Very few. Do lesbian and bisexual women receive HPV vaccine at the same rate of heterosexual women? Who agrees with that? All right. And who thinks that lesbian women need pap smears on the same schedule as heterosexual women? Great. Okay. So my talk will address all three questions. You passed the, the last one. Um, so keep, keep alert for the other answers. So 1% to 5% of your female patients are going to be lesbian and bisexual women. But whether they share it with you is going to be dependent on whether your office appears welcoming at the front desk. Sometimes people will rainbow sticker on their window at the front desk or a little non-discrimination statement that really reassures patients they're going to be treated with respect. Most lesbian bisexual women want you to know as their physician that they have a female partner, but the majority of them don't feel safe coming out. So that's going to be a challenge for you to look at your forms to make sure there's blanks besides just married, single, you know, heterosexual. Overall, I mean, sexuality, we've learned, is very fluid. There are some, 10% of lesbians have only been sexually active with women during their lifetimes, but 90% of lesbians have had sex with men. So that's where it gets a little confusing for research and for self-identification and also behavior. We learned from the AIDS epidemic that you can't study STDs in gay men who self-identify as gay. You have to look at behavior because often they self-identify as heterosexual, they'll have gay sex at the park, they'll go home to their wives and their children, and, and that's not really accurately what you're studying. So, you know, asking every patient, and I'm kind of sometimes shy about asking hard questions, but I've been doing this for 40 years now. Every patient, are you sexually active? Are you sexually active with men, women, neither? Um, and my straight patients, the majority of my patients are straight, they actually open up to me about things that they're worried about and that I didn't label them. And, you know, I shot up in college some heroin. Do you mind checking hep C antibody? You know, they know that I'm open, I'm inclusive, and it's only enriched uh, my relationship with my patients. So don't be shy about asking this question. Very rarely you're going to get someone who's upset. So if women who self-identify, yes, I'm a lesbian, actually... 30% are actually sexually active with men at the same time. This is very tricky because when we did our survey a long time ago in this resident research clinic, which now has turned into Lion Martin Health Services in San Francisco, it so miraculously has actually survived as a source of services for sexual minority patients and homeless women. You have to um, address the issue of contraception. And, and so it was interesting listening to Christine's talk you want to do it sensitively because the major reason lesbians did not go back to see their providers, they felt that birth control was pushed on them, okay? The provider saw them as a 24-year-old, probably sexually active patient, and, and they, you know, didn't understand about they really don't need birth control. But, in fact, some of them have male partners, and the unintended pregnancy rate in young lesbians is higher than in young heterosexual women. And this was a shock. This was a national survey. And somebody said, oh, you have to have it backwards. How could this possibly be true? And then you think about, well, it came again next year. Same result. And the alcohol use in our community is higher. The number of lesbians sleep with their gay male friends. I mean, there is um, a lot of bisexuality that happens. But yet they may identify as lesbian. So the way to get to this is that, oh, I see you identified as a lesbian on my intake questionnaire. You know, some of my lesbian patients, you know, do occasionally sleep with men. Has that happened to you? And are you protecting yourself from unintended pregnancy or from sexually transmitted infections? So that's one way to kind of choose language carefully so you know they can feel in the tone of your voice that you're an ally, that you're not there to judge them, that you understand. In fact, by the end of this next 30 minutes, you're going to be an expert in lesbian health because very few people know the information that we're sharing with you today. Lesbians are very diverse. 
a little bit more urban-centered than rural-centered, but in every other way, all ethnic groups, ages, incomes. I'm going to now take you through a little bit of the life cycle of a lesbian, self-identified lesbian. Um, Diamond at University of Utah has studied self-identity, and even now it's more fluid than ever. Young people do not like categories. And in fact, when you leave those blanks as to how you identify, you're going to get some very interesting adjectives, like bi-curious, gender fluid. Um, and so just use the language that they're using to connect. But she found that 67% over 10 years had changed their identity. And we talked about this that most lesbians want you to know, but they're a little bit shy about that because they actually feel they will get, get inferior medical care because they've identified as a sexual minority. And I even have, I had a friend who's been out for years in the community and activist. She was afraid to have brain surgery for, you know, a meningioma because she felt that he knew she was a lesbian and he might kill her. I mean, it's a very basic fear that folks have, and some of it came from the AIDS epidemic where our government totally abandoned um, the folks with AIDS in our country. And so we talk about history with the black community and the tragedies we've caused as physicians. We have to regain the trust of sexual minority patients, and just having strong communication is the first way to start. Childhood sexual abuse and physical abuse is higher in children who are identified by their parents as different and who may become lesbians. We now know that the rate of HPV vaccine is much lower in lesbian identified adolescents, and this is the beginning of a health disparity. We know that lesbians get cervical cancer, and the Gay Day Parade every year in San Francisco is a lesbian who has cervical cancer who has her sign, have you had your pap smear? Because lesbians do get cervical cancer. We now know that HPV virus does get transmitted between women. And that's one thing I learned, is that lesbians really get freaked out when you tell them they have a sexually transmitted infection, because they feel that they're safe, that it's the men who are the reservoirs. But it's not true, and, um, and so you need to take the time to explain that and reassure them. So one thing you should be aware of is that it may need a little more explanation if, you know, if you're a pediatrician and a mother brings in her 12-year-old, 13-year-old who's already come out that, you know, she likes girls, that she needs to be vaccinated just as much as, you know, someone who hasn't declared her sexuality yet. There's more alcohol in the community, more sexual assault, people, you know, Sexual violence is about violence, and it's not about sexual identity. And with more use of alcohol, of course, it's more common. This is one of the most important papers, I think, that have, has come out for our community in many years. Caitlin Ryan is um, a PhD at San Francisco State, and she was able to show the outcomes of youth and how their family react to their coming out have a lot to do with their health outcomes. So if you have a family who's very accepting, there's less depression, less substance use, and less unprotected sex. Now what are the rejecting behaviors by families? They include taking down her decorations, telling her she'll grow out of it, kind of ignoring that she ever said it in the first place, asking her not to show up to family events, especially with her friends, keeping her identity a secret, telling her that she's doomed. And then the flip is the accepting behaviors. Now, Caitlin works with communities that have traditionally been homophobic, and she works with the Mormon community, she works with the Catholic Hispanic communities, because the parents, they don't have the words to tell their children that they love them without sometimes assistance from materials because the words they might use might alienate their children forever. And so Caitlin's asked to come to these communities to educate parents whose children might be LGBT and they might come out and 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 they, no parent, no matter what their child, that's probably an overstatement, most parents um, want their children to be healthy and even if they are engaging in behavior that they do not approve of. And they want to be educated and they want to continue that connection with their child. Interpersonal violence which, Norma Jo, we are still continuing education at UCSF. With the new curriculum, we had to fight again for curriculum time for IPV. It's, it's, it like thank you. It does exist in the lesbian and bisexual women's community, probably at the same prevalence as in the heterosexual community, but it has some issues. One is sometimes both women claim to be the victim if the police are called, and 
and it's uh, and some of the techniques of threats have to do with outing the partner at work, which couldn't wouldn't be an issue, of course, with heterosexual couple, etc. Some of the factors are the same as in heterosexual IPV, um, but Janice Ristock did some research in Canada and found out that sometimes it's the older woman um, with a, a newly coming out lesbian who then is abusive and then the young lesbian thinks that's normal for lesbian relationships and then that the perpetrator often varies. It's not like in heterosexual relationships, 90% of it's the male. Sometimes in lesbian relationships, it actually alternates. Smoking is a huge public health problem with lesbians. Their um, smoking rate in many studies has now been documented to be about twice to three times that of heterosexual women. And now we're seeing an older population with more COPD, more asthma, and probably more lung cancer. But we haven't really started measuring cancer rates in the LGBT community till recently. You're right, pap smears should be done at the same rate as in heterosexual women. But I've had some of my lesbian patients told that by their doctor, they don't need pap smears because they're only sleeping with women. And so we need to educate everybody about that. And these are reasons why there are less pap smears. Depression is more common in lesbians. We know that it's not a gay gene of depression because they're LGBT, but it's the common experience of daily oppression. Similar to the hypothesis in African Americans that hypertension is a result of continued discrimination. Vicki Mays did some of this research at UCLA. We know that lesbians tend to use, in California, psychotherapy more frequently than actually antidepressants compared to heterosexual women. And also serious mental health issues occur in lesbians probably at the same rate as heterosexual women. We talked about contraception, that lesbians sometimes do need birth control. A lot of lesbians have had oral contraceptive exposure, which is good because it decreases the risk of ovarian cancer. Although we now know that 70% of ovarian cancer actually comes from the tube and not the ovary, which is a surprise to all of us. And in terms of STDs, it, they can go back and forth between lesbians. I mentioned HPV, genital herpes. I use the same precautions in my lesbian patients as I do my heterosexual patients. Very little information about if chlamydia goes back and forth or gonorrhea, but certainly if you have a patient you're treating for vaginitis and she recurs and she has a female partner, the female partner should be checked out also. Jean Mazarow at University of Washington found that lesbians in ages like 18 to 25 have a higher chlamydia rate than heterosexual youth because they have increased number of partners. And so pretty much all women should be screened annually for chlamydia because of course we know it can be a silent um, you know, attacker of the tubes and result in infertility. Lesbians have less sexual dysfunction than um, heterosexual women but very few people ever disclose to their doctors that they're having sexual dysfunction. You can see 3% shared that with their, with their doctor. A lot of lesbians are forming their families. We call it family building. Most are using donor insemination, sometimes from a known donor and sometimes from an unknown donor. It's a big decision and often I'll send a couple if they're not concordant to a therapist to figure this out because there are advantages and disadvantages of each. If they're women of means, they have the option of co-maternity or co-IVF in which you have one woman can donate the egg and then they have the fertilization of the sperm and then the other partner of the couple will carry the pregnancy. And that way they both share in parts of the pregnancy. Um, but as a perinatologist or someone who works with high-risk OB, having an IVF pregnancy increases your risk in general of preterm birth, maybe a slight increased risk of birth defects. I mean, it's, it's not a benign thing to undergo IVF. Any woman of reproductive age, I think, should be asked by the time she's 30 years old, what are her plans for building her family? Because the myth in America is that, oh, you just have to get your career done, and you can start planning your family at 40. And those of us in OB know that your stats start going down at 30, and you really need to think carefully. There's no perfect time for a pregnancy you don't want to run out of time and end up with no options at the end. The, um, so anyway, I think all young women should be on vitamins from 
I don't know, adolescence until 60, just because it decreases the risk of spina bifida and possibly congenital heart disease, and 50% of pregnancies are unplanned in our country. So about two to six million children in the U.S. are currently raised by LGBT parents, and look at that surprising number of spots where the majority, a lot of them are being raised, very conservative areas. Um, we know a lot about the outcomes of children raised by LGBT parents. You really can't tell them apart from children who are raised by heterosexual parents. There are some, you know, st stigma in adolescents, although some adolescents think it's cool to have LGBT parents. Some of them go back in the closet because they want their own identity. And um, a big meta-analysis at USC showed the children were a little bit less aggressive and more nurturing. And these are just some stories I put together for our medical students who wanted to not make the mistake of a lesbian couple walking into the ER with a three-year-old with an ear infection saying, now which one of you is the real mother? So you need to be really sensitive. These are very personal stories. Of course, if you're going to take someone to the OR, you need to make sure the legal guardian is someone who signs the consent form. But it, it's very um, complex sometimes. This is a couple of docs, and they had Max, who is now actually 18 and going off to college, and then a surprise IVF result of twins two years later. This is a family in Ohio, um, a mom doc and a mom attorney who tag teamed when the kids were young. They were adopted by racial kids. So one would stay home in the morning, one would stay home in the afternoon, and they worked part time. And so you'll see a lot of different social institutions, which are quite interesting, um, by these alternative families. This is two academic moms raising Daniel with his two dads big parent-teacher conferences. Um, Daniel spent 60% of his time with his moms and 40% with his dads, but that allowed his mothers to do their usual, you know, career building and traveling. And this is the more prototypic lesbian couple, they're both PE teachers. I'm saying that tongue in cheek. But these were our patients, and this is Terry and Mary. And why I'm showing their family is that Mary got pregnant first um, with McKaylee with the same donor that was then used when Terry got pregnant. But when Mary got pregnant, Terry's mother said, you know, I am not the grandmother. You know, I'll come visit you guys, but this is really weird, and I'm just, I don't accept it. And then Terry got pregnant with her blood grandchild, and she totally rejected the family, and so Terry had to go visit her without the kids, you know, once a year down in Orange County. So there's a lot of, of um, ripples that happen when people make unpopular decisions from their family of origin. So you'll find a lot of lesbians with families of choice. And so they may have a partner or a friend who comes to them for a doctor visit as opposed to a family member because sometimes the rejection has been so severe that there just is no resource there later as adults. I'm probably running out of time, but I'm just gonna BMI is elevated in lesbians. We're trying to figure out why. Being fit, of course, is really important. And there's been some focus groups done um, from a grant from Washington on, um, on lesbians who hadn't realized when they're in the focus groups later that their earlier decisions about their weight would affect their chronic illnesses of arthritis and not being able to get out of the house easily, et cetera. Um, we found that lesbians have less participation in sports, even at the high school level, because they're embarrassed and they um, also don't join like lesbian softball teams because they're embarrassed they'll be seen by people. So encouraging your patients to exercise is one of the most powerful things we can do. Spend a little bit more time if you have a, a sexual minority uh, female patient about that. Breast cancer in lesbians may be slightly increased in heterosexual women, but because they have more risk factors like alcohol use, nulliparity. Um, but all women are at risk, of course, for breast cancer. And um, screening mammograms are being used probably at the same rate at this point for lesbians and heterosexual women. As I mentioned before, pulmonary disease is increased in lesbian women, um, and we worry about COPD and lung cancer. There's also recent studies coming out showing that cardiovascular disease has increased. One study showed that lesbians and bisexual women were 14% older in terms of vascular terms versus women who are heterosexual. And this now has kind of gone to end of life issues. Many, even couples, lesbian couples, do not have their health directives in order. And this is something we should be addressing with all of our patients. And we get, we have this issue with young, pregnant women who end up on ventilators because of respiratory failure, 
for one reason when they're pregnant and they have a boyfriend and nobody knows who has the power to make their decisions. So all of us and all of our parts of our medical lives need to make sure that people have their healthcare decider, you know, have their advanced directives in order. Lesbians are accepting of hospice and palliative care. In fact, one study showed they're more accepting than heterosexual women. Um, but the decision to enter hospice is very complicated because they sometimes have to come out again. And it's a well-known stories of LGBT people being very poorly treated in nursing homes. And a lot of people go back into the closet because there's a lot of prejudice uh, by the caregivers there. If a woman is not out and she loses her life partner, she has a lot more trouble with her grieving. It's complicated grieving because the usual public honoring of someone who's lost a partner isn't present. And it's, um, it's a big loss. So all these slides are on the website. I know I went through them very fast. Um, but I really want to emphasize that you all have a tremendous power to offer great health care to this underserved population. Connect, be inclusive, check when you go back home in your clinics as medical students, you know, do there, is there room for being inclusive on your forms? If not, talk to the administrators, be an advocate. This community is very small, and without allies like yourselves, um, changes would not have been made. And we have a historic time right now where we've really made progress, but we need everyone, including advocacy at the institutional level for um, our sexual minority patients. So become involved, enjoy this unique population, and help us figure out what our next steps are in terms of research, because you're on the front lines and you can be very observant and help us really improve health outcomes of this sexual minority. And I also want to put a plug in, your LGBT colleagues in your workplace, some are out and some aren't out. And we know there's an increased risk of suicide and depression in physicians in general and in women physicians and in LGBT um, physicians. There's one study of LGBT physicians of whom the majority had heard other colleagues make very homophobic remarks. So be sensitive to that. Invite their partners with them to your social events. Um, just let them know you're inclusive. Some of our, our straight um, residents actually put a little rainbow stripe on their name tag just so that people know that you know they're, they're there to talk with. They're inclusive. And that can go a long way. So I want to thank you very much for your engagement and enjoy joining us on this journey to improving the health outcomes of our LGBT population. Thank you.